Hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill and I'm the coordinator for this seminar. Today is the start of a new seminar series and you will hear more about it after a few logistics. The presenters today are fine with clarifying questions but only after the seminar since we have four set speakers. If, and if your questions can wait, um, I mean, so go ahead and type them into the chat box if you have a question and we'll get to it when we can. If you are interested in getting a PDF copy or MP4 recording of today's presentation, please contact the folks listed in the chat box and we will be happy to send you a copy. And last, if you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list, but you would like to be, please contact me and I will add you to the list. Folks in the room, please silence your phones and sign in. And I will now turn the floor over to Gina DG Antonio, a contractor for NOAA's Office of Atmospheric Research, Laboratories and Cooperative Institutes. And Gina will introduce the seminar series and hosts and today's seminar and speakers. Gina, take it away. Thanks, Tracy. Welcome to this webinar on reducing societal impacts from hazardous weather and other environmental phenomena, the first of four seminars in the inaugural NOAA Science Support Seminar Series. The sponsors for the NOAA Science Support Seminar Series include the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, Emma Kelly, Laura Newcomb, myself, and the fabulous NOAA One Science Seminar Coordinator, Tracy Gill. The NOAA Science Support is an annual report that highlights NOAA's scientific accomplishments for the year. The NOAA Science Support celebrates NOAA's research and development in four sections, the introduction, science highlights, bibliometrics, and NOAA's scientific workforce. Together, these sections highlight how NOAA's research products impact the lives of all Americans. This year's report will be released later this month on the NOAA Research Council website. Stay tuned. The report spans the entire range of NOAA's mission, and there are 64 stories featured in the 2019 report. Today, we welcome four speakers whose work is in the science highlights section on reducing societal impacts from severe weather and other environmental phenomena. Our speakers are Clinton Wallace, the director of NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, which is the nation's official civilian source of space weather alerts and warnings, and one of the National Space Weather's nine national centers of environmental prediction. Jeff Craven. Jeff has been in operational forecast settings for 24 of his 29-year career with the National Weather Service. He joined the National Weather Service headquarters at the Meteorological Development Laboratory in 2017, and he is the chief of their statistical modeling division. Jamie Rome is the storm surge specialist and team lead at NOAA's National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida, and serves as a subject matter expert on storm surge and coastal inundation for the National Weather Service's hurricane program. He is also the NOAA representative for the Tri-Agency National Hurricane Program. Kim Quico McLean is a research scientist and the Societal Impacts Group Team Lead for the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies and the National Severe Storms Laboratory. Her research involves behavioral science focused on weather and climate risk, especially informed decision making to support warning response and issues in the communication of forecast uncertainty. Thank you for joining us. Each of the four speakers will give a 10 minute presentation and as Tracy said, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Take it away, Clinton. Okay, uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at. I'm Clinton Wallace, the director of the Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. And today I'll talk a little bit about the National Weather Service's Space Weather Service's support for human space exploration and also for commerce. Start out with, I'll talk a little bit about the, the history of the support that we've provided for human space exploration, especially considering we're, we're approaching our 150th anniversary uh, with the National Weather Service and 50 years um, as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So I'll discuss a little bit uh, about that transition um, over, over the years with human space, uh, space exploration. I'll talk a little bit about space weather effects on human space exploration and also um, the support that we provide uh, directly today. So the Space Weather Prediction Center, which was formerly um, the Space Disturbance Laboratory as part of the Environmental Science Service Administration, started support for our human space exploration back with the Gemini um, program. Before the Gemini program was the Mercury program, so 1965. Um, and NASA reached out to what uh, 
ESA SDL for space weather support. And what we did is uh, took our personnel that were in Boulder and they rotated down to Johnson Space Center and provided direct support to mission control. So during every, before every flight, we would send down one of our folks. They would sit with uh, the flight directors and, and, the, um, and the medical personnel down there and advise them uh, direct decision support that they were providing to, to, to NASA for the Gemini program. And we supported 10 Gemini, um, 10 Gemini um, Earth orbits. Uh, this is all leading up to us uh, going, going to the moon. And then during the Apollo program, um, this was a game changer for us. Uh, before Apollo, humans had never left the protective uh, cocoon, if you will, of Earth's magnetic field. And it's the Earth's magnetic field that protects us from a lot of the radiation that we see coming off the, the, sun, the sun. And one of Neil Armstrong's really uh, biggest concerns was um, a solar flare that would occur during a mission. So um, it was, you know, we started this support back in 1970, I mean, before 1970, at the beginning of the Apollo program, but that's when um, ESA transitioned into become the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and where we were, the Space Disturbances Lab became the Space Environment uh, Space Environment Lab, which today is known as the Space Weather Prediction Center. And the Space Weather Prediction Center has transitioned into the National Weather Service back in 2005. But during, throughout the entire all the Apollo missions. We were fortunate. We didn't have any space weather outbreaks during any of the emissions, uh, the missions, and so we successfully supported 11 Apollo crew flights. So six of those landing on the moon between 1968 and 1972. However, between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17, we got lucky. Um, unfortunately, um, this uh, video here doesn't work, but. On August 7th, 1972, we saw one of the largest solar storms that we've ever seen on record. Um, if this would have occurred during a mission, uh, we would have seen that the astronauts would have likely had acute radiation sickness, um, especially if they were outside of the, the spacecraft, uh, whether on the surface, the lunar surface, or um, if you know astronauts had been doing spacewalks at that time. Um, we would have definitely seen uh, acute radiation sickness. In fact, um, one of the countermeasures that NASA had put in place, if there was a solar flare while the astronauts were on the moon, was for uh, one astronaut to essentially lay on top of the other astronaut and uh, you know, potentially you know, sacrificing the one astronaut. That was an extreme countermeasure, but one that was put in place um, at that time to protect against uh, radiation from a solar flare. So the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is now the Space Weather Prediction Center's uh, support, um, also extended to Skylab. Now Skylab was really important to us because that was the first time that we had uh, put a chronograph or a way of taking pictures of the sun um, on, in, in space. So we were actually able to start seeing pictures directly of the sun from space. Um, and for the astronauts who were on Skylab, would travel to Boulder, uh, receive training from um, our staff at the Space Weather Prediction Center on how to use uh, a chronograph, um, how to use the instrumentation that was on the, the solar weather instrumentation that was on Skylab. Um, then we also, um, 133 successful uh, shuttle missions did SOPSI support. Now, during the shuttle era, we weren't sending um, our forecasters down the Johnson Space Center anymore. We've kind of evolved with the internet and communications a little bit. Um, but for all the shuttle missions, we provided uh, pre-launch space weather briefings. We provide space weather briefings one hour before all the spacewalks, um, throughout the spacewalks. Essentially, whenever we had a shuttle in space, the Space Weather Prediction Center was providing support. So the Space Weather Prediction Center has a long heritage of providing uh, support for human space exploration. Now, um, you know, we aren't, you know, we haven't been launching astronauts recently on U.S. Um, assets into space, but we've continued to have um, a 
presence in space on the International Space Station. So I told you, you know, back it was 1972, we saw the, that solar flare, that big radiation storm that occurred. Um, but at that time, it, we, we didn't have instruments in space to actually measure the radiation yet. It wasn't until uh, was it 1974 that we had um, instrumentation on the, the GOES uh, spacecraft. So in January 2005, we saw something really quite unusual that we hadn't seen, hadn't been able to measure before. Um, this storm, not as big as that 1972 storm, but we were able to get a measurement. If you look at the graph on the far right, the, the one at the green line, this is a proton flux, so a measure of radiation. And the green line rep represents 100 mega electron volts. So this is the type of um, energy that will penetrate through your skin. It will, it will impact instrumentation. It's, it's one of the, the measures that we really look at for an extreme solar storm. Um, and we saw that. The, the magnitude of this uh, shot up, which you can see is almost instantaneous. We would go from fairly background normal levels, solar flare, and as soon as that energy can leave the sun and, and, and make it to Earth, it's an immediate spike up. So we're not giving a great deal of lead time to our astronauts. It, there's just no way, we're, that's not where we are with the science today, to be able to give a great deal of lead time. We have to see the flare. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like with a volcanic eruption. We, we, we kind of know some precursors are going on, but we don't really know exactly when the eruption is going to happen. And then the eruption happens, and it wanes off. So um, during this event on the, the, that green line, you'll see that it stays um, above the 100 um, proton flux units there. That above 100 is about when we're seeing the extreme effects from the radiation. And so you'll see that went on for um, a couple, you know, a couple, two, three hours there. And again, um, later that year, we saw something pretty unusual in December 2005, where we saw a solar flare again, but this was on the side of the sun, the limb of the sun. And typically, with a solar flare on the limb of the sun, we wouldn't see a great deal of um, radiation. Um, it, it has a lot to do with the connection between the sun and the Earth. Um, but indeed, ooh, did we lose it? Uh, if we look at the, the graph here, off goes 11 again. This time the blue line represents what the green line above was showing. We saw flaring you know, in three different instances, um, but again, off the side of the, largely off the side of um, the, the sun. So something else that we saw that a, 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 you know, the threat was more, uh, we were, we we're seeing these effects of the sun in a more real way. So changing gears a little bit now, um, what we're showing here is a not-to-scale model of um, the Earth and the Moon, Mars. And what I'd like to point out here is that um, the International Space Station um, flies in that kind of hatched um, yellow line about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. And the, the, the lines, that, the orange lines that you see around it represent the Earth's magnetic field. And you can see that the International Space Station stays largely always within the Earth's magnetic field. Um, it's only when you get up towards the, po the poles, and the, the International Space Station has a very high inclination orbit, about 53 degrees north and south um, is its max extent, that um, it's more exposed to the effects of uh, radiation because uh, the, the radiation comes down in towards the poles during the um, a solar storm. It's kind of like why you, a little bit of why you see the aurora over the north and south poles. But the game changer here, for, as we go back to the moon, as we potentially go back to Mars, is you can see that that, that magnetic field, the, the magnetosphere, only extends about on the, the leading edge, the, 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 the side facing towards the sun, about 40,000 uh, miles. And downstream, because of the solar wind, you know, blows the, magnet, the magnetic field lines uh, downstream, about 800,000 miles. But um, the moon, 240,000 miles away, and Mars, oh, well, you know, seven months travel, and it has a very weak magnetic field. So um, you're not having any protection um, from radiation as we get outside of uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Our primary customer in NASA okay, is the 
Sorry. My bad. That was me. Okay. Um, the pr our primary customer within NASA is the Solar Radiation Analysis Group, SHRAD, who communicates with the, the flight surgeon, the flight directors, and our international partners. All that information, uh, we're con in a continuous dialogue with the SHRAD. We talk with them every morning at 1030 in the morning and then more frequently as events are going on. And then um, our current support for the International Space Station, again, every morning we're talking with the Space Radiation Analysis Group down at Mission Control. Um, you know, ramp up our communications, uh, we're providing them with all of our data. Um, and this is not just to protect the astronauts, but also lots of sensitive equipment that we have, over 400 pieces of sensitive equipment um, on the International Space Station. So that's the support we're currently providing. And as we move forward into the future, um, if you saw uh, Vice President uh, Pence's announcement uh, back in March, that we have now have Space Policy Directive uh, 1, which is to return the, uh, well, to return to the moon, so to land the first woman and the next man um, at the South Pole of uh, the moon by 2024. And there's a number of different assets. One of the things that we'll be doing is putting for the first time um, a space station in orbit around the, the moon, and as I described, you have no protection there um, from uh, radiation around the moon other than what's in your spacecraft. And then um, all the other spacecraft that we're sending to the moon and to Mars. So uh, kind of in conclusion, NOAA, uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center, has a proud heritage of supporting our partners uh, within NASA for human space exploration, and we'll do the same for uh, commercial assets as well into the future. Thank you, Clinton. And next we have Jeff. Hello, I wanted to talk about uh, the National Blend of Models. Uh, the purpose of this project, which actually originated uh, from funding in the wake of uh, Hurricane Sandy, the so-called Sandy Supplemental, is to uh, provide a starting point for our weather service forecast. Uh, what you have here is an example of a uh, forecast from about three days out to a day in advance of a snow event in uh, January that impacted the Midwest. Uh, the forecast in the upper left is a 24-hour snow amount. Uh, the official forecast from the Weather Service. The lower left is the observed snowfall using what we call no risk, which is a analysis of uh, snow depth that we get from uh, from Minnesota, actually, and uh, now the uh, water center in uh, Tuscaloosa. And it shows a fairly heavy band of snow exceeding 12 inches fell in the arrowhead of Minnesota. Uh, the two forecasts that are looping in from about three days out to one day out on the right are uh, examples of the operational version of the National Blend in the upper right and the parallel version, the one that we hope will be implemented in a couple weeks. Uh, and you can see as the event approaches, both the blend and the official forecast do focus an area of heavier snow approaching 12 inches over the arrowhead. So the purpose is, again, our routine forecast and also high impact forecast. So this, this is basically sort of our mission or creed with the blend. Uh, we had some efforts out in the forecast offices, uh, particularly in uh, western and central region of the Weather Service that started experimenting with having blends of models, as we call it, rather than just initializing with individual models. Uh, the Weather Prediction Center also had done that. And these forecasts are generated over six domains. We, we call it the CONUS, the, the Contiguous 
uh, U.S., the lower 48, if you will, in the upper left, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a new Guam uh, forecast that will start here in a couple of weeks. And then we have a very large oceanic domain that is intended for use with from the Hurricane Center, uh, the Ocean Prediction Center, and uh, potentially down the line, even the Aviation Weather Center for upper air type uh, products. So really, the, I like to think of the National Blenheim Models as a mutual fund of weather models. Uh, we have the Thrift Savings Plan, and you can pick you can pick the S fund, the G fund, the I fund. Uh, if you invest outside of TSP, you might have you might own a mutual fund. If you invest for your, it, it really is tough to pick winning stocks, and it's it's very tough to pick the most accurate model every day. So. What we, what we do is we create, what we, it's really a multi-model ensemble. And actually, it's, it's, there's models from outside of the weather service. The Canadian models, we just added an Australian model, and of course, the European Center model a couple of years ago. Um, so it helps us to minimize error. You're not necessarily, if you use it as a starting point, you're not necessarily going to nail the forecast. But you do sort of guard yourself against really big misses by doing this. And I think the next step in using the National Blend is how do we start with it and then actually try to hedge towards the more likely scenarios. I think that's really where uh, this will come in handy. So on social media, you might see folks talking about you know, the GFS model did this, the European model did that, but we have 171 different model inputs for rainfall forecasts. So it's, it's a lot more complex than just looking at a few models. So this is a, an example that doesn't include all 171 inputs on the left, but it, we, what we do is we merge not only high resolution models um, in the short term, but also the global models and ensembles. Uh, and of course, an ensemble had, may have 20, 30, or 50 different members to it. And the statistical post-processing things that we like we call MOS, which is model output statistics. There's other ways to do. Uh, statistical post-processing is you take the models a step further and try to calibrate them to observations to remove bias. So there's a blending step, a calibration step, and then a final forecast, which we distribute not only to WFOs, which we call it weather, the weather forecast offices, but also. Um, and how does this do? Well, uh, this just shows an October uh, dashboard and what we were, we're trying to assess is is at least as good or not better or better the starting point than our current official forecast and basically green positive numbers if you compare it to our gridded analysis uh, which is our we call it the uh, real-time mesoscale analysis is it and in most cases it's it's even better than the uh, starting point uh, from our official forecast. So we think that certainly will help in the process of focusing in the future more on not the forecast itself, but the impacts of the weather and the decision support that will help our core stakeholders make the decisions they need to do. So uh, we, we have some regions of the Weather Service that have already started using this. Uh, the central region adopted using uh, the starting point in June of this year. Uh, as soon as the new version, version 3.2, comes out in a couple of weeks, uh, southern and western region plan on doing using the day four to seven as their starting point. They certainly could still adjust it. 
And uh, the Weather Prediction Center over in College Park has been increasingly using it as a first initial starting point uh, for rainfall and their day four to seven forecasts. Uh, this just gives you, I'll just run through this in a few seconds. The key to, I think, we're using the National Plan for deterministic forecast, for single number forecast, and customers want to know how much rain, is there going to be an inch of rain today? But we really know that there is lots of variability, particularly with things like thunderstorms. Uh, there's, so if you, if you look at this, this is actually the 10th percentile. And what this means is that we would expect 90% of the situations like this to have more rainfall. So if you go through this, this is the 25th, 50th. What we really need to do is express uncertainty in the ranges of possibilities, not just try to pick the best single number. And that's what we think this will be very valuable for in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next we have Jamie Rome. Okay, just going to confirm that you can hear me. If you can speak up a little bit, it'd be great. All right, how about now? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so I'm obviously not there. I'm coming, uh, beaming in from uh, uh, toasty Miami uh, this morning. And um, that actually, that, that previous uh, presentation was a perfect segue into mine, which is uh, basically a case study of how probabilistic information was used in the case of Hurricane Dorian for evacuation decision making. Uh, really quickly, um, we, we at the National Hurricane Center and, and many of our WFOs uh, use a probabilistic frame of reference or probabilistic guidance, uh, similar to what you just saw from the QPC perspective, to um, make our, our storm surge forecast. Um, the, the actual name of it is, is P-Surge. It's just the hydrodynamic model. Um, evoked many, many times to produce multiple tracks, as you can sort of see in this, uh, this is uh, an old storm. And from that, you can deduce the probability of an occurrence, or more specifically, what we, we use is exceedances, um, and I'll get into that in a second. It is the official requirement for the Weather Service to a uh, tropical program to be on the probabilistic frame of reference. Right now, we provide it out to 48 hours, the, the limits of predictability right now inhibit us from going beyond 48 hours, but uh, Congress has um, told us to get it to 72 by 2022. And now, I'm going to talk quickly about, we use what's called an exceedance, which is the inverse of a probability. And in this case, um, what I'm going to show you is, in this diagram, there's probability of detection along the y-axis, and then there's false alarm uh, along the x-axis. Now. In a hurricane, and more specifically storm surge, where evacuation decisions hinge, often millions of people hinge on the storm surge uh, forecast, obviously we want to get as high of a probability of detection, but without crying wolf. So in a perfect world, we have a perfect probability of detection and a, a zero uh, false alarm ratio. The problem is that's just not possible because there's significant uncertainty the hurricane moves and wobbles and what have you. So what you see here, and this is the probability of exceeding six feet, the different exceedances, so the 10% exceedance, the 20%, 30, 40, 50, you see these different exceedances plotted uh, along here. So for reference, the dash line is, is no skill, you get fired. Um, in reality, though, what you're trying to get is as far up in this corner or maximizing the area under the curve. So if we advance this, there's the little uh, no skill, perfect, so you can see. Now, if we, if we wanted to absolutely encompass the risk every single time, meaning never, ever, ever be low, um, you would use a 0% exceedance. The problem is, while you would have a perfect probability of detection, your false alarm ratio would be through the roof. So what gets really interesting is when you drop down to the 10% exceedance, so if you go from the 0% to the 10% exceedance, your false alarm ratio drops precipitously while you don't lose that much probability of detection. And if you sort of keep going through this 
uh, this sort of process of stepping down the exceedances, at some point you get to a place where you're, you're just losing so much probability of detection uh, relative to what you're gaining in the false alarm ratio that it no longer becomes uh, profitable to go through this process. And for most people who would look at this and say for life-saving situations where I can't afford to be low, I would choose this, this 10 or 20 percent exceedance. And indeed, indeed, we use this 10 percent exceedance to drive all of our products. The other thing that, that uh, I often have to explain to people, it's, it's hard. Um, we're, de we're taught as scientists to be deterministic. You run a model. You look at the model, and then that model says yes or no, and that's how you brief. The problem is you can't do that for things like rainfall, as you just saw, or storm surge, where slight variations in the, in the forecast can make a big, big deal in societal impacts. So for P surge, we have to evoke this, um, and this is just a, for those of you looking at this math and saying, what is he going with this, this is a, just a basic way to show that the only way to properly um, encapsulate the risk of, of a hurricane is through using these multiple tracks. These, you don't use one track or one model. You've got to use multiple tracks. And when you do the math, the, what's called the RMW, or the size, is in the denominator. And the size of the storm, or the forecast size of the storm, to a large extent determines the number of tracks. So basically, everybody's enamored with intensity or uh, the spaghetti diagrams when, in fact, it's the RMW that, as I like to say, all the money in storm surge is in predicting the RMW. So if you do all the math here, and this is a bit much, but at the bottom line is you've got to run, you run your model about somewhere between six to 700 tracks to back out a reliable, usable, probabilistic solution. And that's indeed what we do. If you look at the average number of tracks we use, um, in our probabilistic frame of reference, um, the old version, which we're about to be superseded by a newer version in 2020, was 750 tracks. And the new version, which goes on supercomputer this year, is 659 tracks. All right, here is the RMW. I wanted to prove to you that all the money is in RMW. If you look at the climatology of RMWs, which is size, basically how big the hurricane is, over the uh, last uh, several years, you get this really big spread um, ranging from you know, 10 or 15 nautical miles all the way to over 150 nautical miles. So you can see how for these weaker storms, you, you're sort of forced into uh, perturbing or, or producing multiple size storms in your probabilistic uh, scenario. Now let's go to Zorian and see why this matters. So if we look at the most conventional way that people think hurricanes, look at hurricanes, educate themselves on hurricanes, and breed hurricanes, it's track. And most notably, people like to show the track models or spaghetti diagrams. But that's often the worst thing one can look at because it's not really encapsulating the full risk, as I'm going to show you here. And as um, was shown in the previous forecast, it's one of many inputs that the forecaster takes into consideration. And the forecaster often beats the models. And I'll, I'll attempt to prove that to you. Now, so here is the GFS, uh, our, our National Weather Service model, what you may have heard of as the American model. Um, but you're most commonly shown just one, one track from the GFS when there's, in fact, multiple tracks in its ensemble, as shown by the blue lines. Similarly, if we add the, um, the European model in green, it has multiple tracks as well. And if I'm going to add another one that you may have not heard of, UK Met model, which is in pink, um, it has multiple tracks as well. So there's, there's so many things to back out of this. First and foremost, if you're going to look at the track model, you have to look at the ensembles, not the individual deterministic version, because that deterministic version does not convey or encapsulate the actual forecast scenario. Um, and then there's multiple models. And we have to take in all these models and make a forecast. And this orange uh, thing that I've superseded or so, sort of superimposed here is the cone, it is the official cone or the official human-generated uh, uh, forecast. And what you see here is it's sort of interesting is that all of a sudden these pink lines are outside of the cone. 
So in this case, the, the forecaster is making a conscious decision to not weigh this particular model, even though up until this point it was one of our best performing models, um, they had weighed the scenario and made a decision not to include it in their forecast. Now why is this important? Because now I'm going to add the tracks that we use for our probabilistic storm surge, and since it follows the human generated forecast, it does not chase those pink lines down into South Florida. Now, why does this all matter? So what does the rubber meet the road? Well, recall at the time that Dorian was a Category 5 uh, parked in here, and if one were to assume these scenarios, or better yet, if one were to brief those scenarios, or worse yet, if an evacuation were ordered based off those scenarios, we'd get a totally different outcome than we actually got in Dorian. Um, and here are the, the probabilistic tracks against the cone. So let's look at what happened in Dorian for that advisory. So on the left is a worst case storm surge a scenario from a westward moving Cat 5. Had Dorian continued its westward march and actually struck South Florida or Miami-Dade County, this is the storm surge that you would get. Now this is pretty much um, would necessitate a near total evacuation of the county uh, to the tune of about a little over a million people. On the right is what we actually provided decision makers and briefed them on, which shows very little storm surge in Miami-Dade and Broward County. This is Broward County where Fort Lauderdale is located. And there's a little bit of storm surge in Palm Beach County, and so keep this in mind. So those pink lines would have had you brief this. In actuality, this is what we briefed, and here is where the rubber meets the road. If one were to estimate the people who would have been evacuated under those scenarios in South Florida, uh, this came from the state of Florida, it's 4.5 million people. In actuality, only 1.4 million people in Florida were ordered to evacuate. That's a delta of 3.1 million people or evacuations stopped uh, owing to this forecast approach and the decision support that went with it. South Carolina similarly shaved off uh, a couple hundred thousand, several hundred thousand evacuations. Uh, Virginia wins the prize for being the, the most, um, uh, they get the best at looking at these probabilistic risk-based uh, guidance products. Um, zone A, which is a minimal, the, the smallest zone, or the, the, the evacuation zone closest to the coast, um, had they pulled the trigger on that, that would have been 225,000 um, people ordered to evacuate. They actually, using the, the guidance that we provided them, they only evacuated 3,000 people. They basically did a very targeted and surgical evacuation. Um, North Carolina is only excluded here because they didn't have evacuations, um, the zones or numbers at the time of this analysis. Um, so if you add all of this up, um, using this probabilistic versus a deterministic frame of reference, <coughs> argue that um, over 3 million, nearly almost 4 million people evacuations were stopped um, due to this forecast approach that uh, in this probabilistic frame of reference without having excessive false alarm. So remember that's how we started the talk is uh, getting a high probability of detection without the false alarm. The bulk of this came from South Florida. Miami-Dade had zero, zero evacuation. I asked them personally, and they said that, that in every other situation in that case, they would have absolutely evacuated. But the, re the reason they didn't is because they heard loud and clear from NOAA, uh, no storm surge. Broward County was uh, similar, zero evacuations. Palm Beach County had a very small targeted evacuation. Given how densely populated that is, that county is, that's actually a, a big accomplishment. And um, I'm going to cut it there just to, to be respectful of the, of the other speakers. Thank you. And next we have Kim, Nico, and Queen. And Kim, you'll need to unmute your mic. Yep, I'm on. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, hi from snowy Norman, Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us today. Today I'll be talking to you about um, 
tornado um, probabilistic information. So it's a really nice follow on from the previous speakers. I'm so glad some of the fundamentals of probabilistic information have been covered. And I'll be taking a slightly different um, stance with respect to what the implications of this information are. I'll be looking at a study where um, we've recently completed on um, estimating economic impact from um, improved tornado information that's probabilistic on businesses specifically. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Kevin Simmons at Austin College, who is the um, co-author of the book, Economic and Societal Impacts of Tornadoes, um, a great work if you haven't read it, and his um, very talented students, Allison Beamer and Seth Howard at Austin College in North Texas. So to get into the, um, the meat of the presentation, what is the Tornado Warning Improvement and Extension Program? This is something that was recently congressionally mandated in the, the Weather Act a couple years ago. And the general idea of it is this. Today on the left side, this is what tornado warnings look like. Um, when, we, when the tornado is imminent, what we offer people is deterministic information. It's, it's a yes, no forecast. But we really know that underneath that, forecasters have some uncertainty. They have uncertainty about whether the tornado will exist um, and, and other attributes of the storm features. And right now, they really aren't empowered to convey that information very clearly. But if we were to develop technologies that could help them, then they could offer those shades of gray. And that's part of what you see on the right. Um, that image is a prototype image of what um, an improved product could look like, where you give the exact probabilities of tornadoes occurring at different points downstream. Another feature of this information is if you're freeing yourself to offer probabilistic information instead of just this yes, no forecast, you can also give information on a longer time horizon. And this could give then um, public, um, in the members of the public or specific end users or businesses, um, instead of just maybe 13 to 18 minutes on average to make decisions, it could offer up to an hour of, um, of lead time, but calibrated and contextualized by these probabilities. So we are focusing on business decisions and um, Interestingly enough, I know that this is not a way that in NOAA we typically frame this problem, um, but we do um, with businesses, it's uh, important to think about false alarms, which we have many in the tornado um, paradigm, can actually carry enormous costs for businesses. Uh, this is studied actually across other content domains and it's a high priority item, for example, in security companies. Um, They've, they've been quoted as saying it's their number one priority, the one issue that they've decided has to be addressed. Because, and I'll, I'll demonstrate the um, sort of basic decision problem, when you have an alarm and you respond as a business, then there's an opportunity cost for that. That means that you are redirecting your staff time or you're actually shutting down production and therefore you're able to make um, less money, sell fewer products and so on. Um, that's what opportunity cost really means for these businesses. So the way we can look at the decision problem is, you know, there are two kinds of actions that businesses could take. They could choose to protect or not to protect, and there could be a tornado outcome or a no tornado outcome. If they choose to protect, whether or not there is a tornado, they've borne this cost, C, the opportunity cost of taking protective action. And you can I highlight in red that if they take the protective action and there isn't a tornado, then that is that cost is essentially to them um, Loan, right? That's a, that's a cost they'd rather not um, bear if they don't have to. Now, if there is a tornado and they have not taken protective action, that's another kind of decision error, L, um, that's um, uncovered losses. So losses they could have mitigated if they'd taken some predict protective action, but they did not. Um, also, finally, the last kind of outcome could be that they take no protective action and there was no tornado, in which case there is no cost or loss. So from these, you can de devise um, or derive a fairly simple decision rule. Businesses, if they're acting rationally, should take protective action if the probability of occurrence is greater than costs divided by losses, the ratio of costs to losses. And um, this is a nice way that we can then compare um, the probabilistic information and relate it to the decision framework for businesses. So here are research questions um, based on this sort of foundation. First, how do businesses respond to weather service warnings now? We don't actually know this. Um, part of the reason is because the private sector does so much for businesses 
but as a public safety alerting product, um, the businesses are doing something with warning information, or they may be, but there's not a lot known about it. Um, so we're just talking about weather service information that's publicly available and not differentiated, just what businesses are doing with that product. And then we ask the question, well, how might they respond to the tweep information? And finally, putting these things together, what are the economic implications of a change in business behavior? Ideally, if the technology does what we would hope it would do, then maybe some of these costs could be saved and there may actually be savings and losses too. I'll show you what this looks like as, um, as we bear the math out. So let's talk about what businesses do with current warnings. Um, we ex examined specifically businesses in um, Grayson County and um, the surrounding Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. There were four um, focus groups organized by the Grayson County Emergency Department of Emergency Management and run by Kevin and his students at Austin College. What they did is they created something called the Behavior Ranking Scale. And essentially, it's just telling us what are all the different kinds of actions businesses take um, right now during warnings? And we don't have time to delve into each item on this scale, but generally items one through five are simply a manager um, checking information and keeping aware. But items six through 10 are all cost bearing items. They're things like redirecting staff time from operations that could otherwise be profit earning or actually shutting down production altogether. We next then did a, a more generalizable study of businesses across the area with a survey. And in this survey, we asked um, businesses to tell us how they responded to current warnings. And then we asked them how they would respond to probabilistic information. We offered them many different um, probabilistic values, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But we were able to construct what's called a calibration curve based on that. And we also asked them what their costs were for responding. Um, so what is that opportunity cost if you take those more extensive protective actions, anything six plus? We distributed the survey this past spring and summer, and um, the students were very, very good and aggressive in getting a large sample. Um, they got 385 total firms to respond, which is a significant fraction of um, firms, especially larger and mid-sized firms in the area. And um, out of those, 182 offered complete enough responses across every probability class that we use them in this analysis. So let's talk a little bit about the deterministic information. With deterministic warnings, what kinds of actions are um, our businesses taking? And you can see from the bottom, uh, there are a lot of information seeking activities being taken, but there are also a lot of six plus actions by businesses. They could select more than one action to take, by the way. Um, but you can see that there is definitely cost being borne um, from businesses taking action during tornado warnings. Now let's compare this to something like a 25% chance that a tornado could occur. You can see this great shift toward just information seeking and not taking protective action that would be cost bearing. It's important to note that 25% is a reasonable um, expectation for some tornado warnings. There are some times where we have what are called QLCS, quasi-linear con quasi -linear convective systems that are perhaps a little bit less certain, um, but we get a lot of tornado warnings out, that, out of that, maybe get you know, weaker, less damaging tornadoes. So this probability value is, is not unreasonable to expect some fraction of tornadoes um, to occur under. You can see, if businesses had probabilistic information, they would prefer to take much different actions than they would with just a warning alone. And as we raise the probability value up to 50%, you see things shift. Um, still a lot of information gathering, but um, a bit more of cost-bearing decision-making as well. 75, oops, I'm sorry, 75%, um, even more cost-bearing decisions. And finally, 100%, um, really this strong shift toward taking protective action that is cost-bearing. So one way to summarize the implications of this is in this following graph. On the bottom are the underlying objective probabilities of tornado occurrence. And um, on the, the y-axis is the proportion of protective decisions businesses take overall. And what we can see when pooling all the businesses' decisions together is there's a level um, they're operating at for deterministic information where they don't see the underlying probable probability. So we just made a straight line. No matter what the probability is, we assume that they'll make the same kind of decision. 
And then you can see in the blue line, the calibration curve changes quite a lot. At low probability values, they're taking much um, few, many fewer protective actions. And um, then they take increasingly more as the graph goes up. One way of then estimating the economic implications of this is to take the area between uh, the deterministic line and the probabilistic line um, and think about you know, what are the implications of businesses taking protective action much more often than they would otherwise prefer to if they had the probabilistic information in hand. So this is the math of that calculation, and I won't dwell on each item, but generally what we're doing is we're calculating for each probability level what the expected cost and expected loss is in that scenario with deterministic information, so given the cost they provided us and the proportion of businesses that took different kinds of actions. Um, what do we expect to be the costs and what do we expect to be the losses? And then to sum up the total economic impact, we find the difference between the deterministic case and the probabilistic case at each probability level. And I'll conclude just with that value then. What do we get when we sum this across all the businesses in the country, looking at, um, we, did, we accounted for things like the density of businesses across the country and the average area covered by warnings um, across the country per year to sort of net how many businesses actually are impacted countrywide um, by warnings. So nationwide, that estimate turns out to be um, most conservatively about $1.17 billion a year that could be saved by businesses taking action in a more tailored way. The median estimate is $1.9 billion a year and upper end estimate $2.79 billion a year. And with that, happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kim, and thank you all presenters. And now we're ready to take questions. Um, folks on the line, you can go ahead and chat your questions into the chat box. I see Gina has a question. Are there any questions in the room while we're waiting? Any questions? Go ahead and type them in. That would be great. So I had a question for the modelers. Um, are you guys all working in the cloud now or on regular machines? Or Jeff, could you speak to that? Or? There, right now, what we're doing isn't on the cloud. Uh, the, the visualization of the data from ensembles and the national blend is being migrated to where the it's on the cloud. And hopefully in the next few months, some of our uh, legacy viewers of the data will actually be running on AWS instead of on local machines on our. So uh, I've heard that they're working, and again, I'm just speculating. I've heard they're working on a cloud-based um, development of some of our short-range models uh, that are going to replace legacy things like the SREF and the, uh, the HER model, the NAM, our, our, our long-time go-to models. That's being developed on the cloud right now. Okay. It won't be out for a couple of years. So the development part is on there, but I don't see it being an operation. Not for a while. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And then we have a question online from Gina who asks, who says, hi, Kim. Is there an embedded assumption that waiting to take action is a good thing? What if the tornado hits and they waited too long? And great presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gina. That's a great question. And that's something um, embedded in the expected loss figure um, calculation that I really didn't get into. I think I still have control. So I'll go back um, really quickly to the calculations page. Um, what we, what we um, put into that expected loss calculation is um, the oops factor. So that is the, the probability of being hit by a tornado and you didn't take protective action. Um, that's what that sort of P is. Um, so when you, the, the, the loss term is essentially exactly what you're talking about, that businesses 
should have taken protective action because there actually was a tornado and they didn't. And so they're incurring um, a loss from failing to protect. So that is something that is embedded in the calculation. Okay, thank you. And uh, Kim, this looks like another question for you from Stan. At what lead time was the probabilistic data provided to the business decision makers? Yeah, so the, um, another great question in this, they were told that they had an hour to make the decision um, for, for each of the items. And this was a, a bit of a difficulty in um, just trying to get, trying to relate probability. The, the, sorry, I'll, I'll um, summarize to say the decision should really be a function of probability and time. We tried to hold the time element um, a bit constant. We told them that there, the, the probability was over the next hour that that would occur. So there may be some element in this of withholding action because there is time, um, but they were, they were also told in the scenario, you know, this is the only point at which you're able to make this decision. Um, imagine that it takes that long to, to do, to execute your full plan. Something like this um, was what was described to them in the scenario to try to force them to make that call, even if it was a little bit early. Um, if we were to expand this study to try to encompass the, the value of time, we would need to add a lot more um, scenarios, and that would be possible, but that's not something our study covered. Okay, thank you. And then we had a question about, will the uh, presentation be available online? Um, it probably will be eventually, but we can also send you the PDF or the MP4 if you just go ahead and Google or uh, email any one of those people up there, we'll be able to help you out. And um, if there aren't any more questions, we have one more slide from uh, Gina. Oh, let me see. Oh, you want to go, do you want to do the this, this slide right here? Yeah. Hold on a second. Where are you? Just the last line. Okay. The next, do you want to talk about these next ones? Um, sure. So I'll just let you know that this is the first seminar of the series, and there will be three more. The next one will be held on Wednesday, February 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, please visit the NOAA one science seminar webpage to register. Okay, sorry guys, we're flipping around with some pictures. I guess we uh, didn't know where the extra slides were. Anyway, I hope you can join us on um, the next, yeah, did you mention the uh, time and the date? Okay, great everybody, thanks for joining us and we hope to talk to you on the 19th and I hope you'll join us again. Thanks for the presenters online, Jamie, Kim, and thanks for the presenters in the room. Uh, yeah. Around. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Kim.